chapter 1. We're going to continue our series here on In Christ. In Christ. Where are we? We're in Marlboro. But we're also in Christ, right? We're in Christ. Look what Paul says here to the Ephesians. He says in verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus, Okay. To the saints who are in Ephesus. To the saints who are in Marlboro. That's us. That's where we are. But also the faithful in Christ Jesus. So Paul here is talking about two locations, right? Ephesus and in Christ. And then for us also we can say this, right? This is the epistle to the Marburians, right? The, 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 the to the saints who are in Marlboro and also the faithful in Christ Jesus. Lord, bless this message and this time together. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. This is something that we've been talking and thinking a lot about, just where we are and what we are. It's a great thought, isn't it? What am I? Have you ever thought that? What am I? Who am I? Psalm chapter 8 and verse 4, David says, What is man that you were mindful of him? What is man that you were mindful of him? Or the son of man that you would visit him? Not only that you would be mindful and you would be thinking about man, but that you would visit man. And I think based on those two things, that God is mindful of us and that He would visit us, Job says it somewhere in the book of Job. Your visitation has preserved my spirit. Like those things, those two things, his thinking about us and his visiting us lead us to a conclusion or something that we are more than just the sum of our parts. We are more than just a bucket of dust with a few pieces thrown in the mix, right? A few extra pieces. But we are, we are more than that. We are, uh, made for fellowship with God. I was speaking with someone yesterday and he said, do you believe in life after this? And I said, absolutely. Absolutely. He said, I believe in life beyond this more than this itself. And because this is so, uh, it can change so easily. And we're just talking about our bodies and how limited they are and how we could do everything possible, everything necessary to take care of ourselves and to make sure that we are safe. But then somebody else can so dramatically affect us physically. Isn't that interesting? I'll eat only celery or tofu or something. Do all of this, take, make sure everything's okay. But because of my genetics, even that causes a problem in my heart. What do we say? We look down the line. We look back in history and say, why did you do that? No, it's, it's what we are. We're limited. But because we're designed for this thing right here, look at this, this, this community, this fellowship, being together. Wherever you go, people are getting together. Right? Wherever you go, whatever the context, people are doing something together. We're made this way. And it is not just the material parts coming together, right? Imagine, what if this, is that what it is? Like people with brown hair here, people with blonde hair here, people with blue eyes over here. Is it like a physical coming together? Is that what we're drawn to? No, it's not. It's a communion and it's a, and it's a fellowship of something bigger. It's a fellowship of God. Uh, and we are designed in His image and His likeness. And beyond this whole thing, beyond all of us, is God in fellowship with God. And we are like a little representation of it here. So here on earth, right, to the saints who were in Marlboro, but also, also in Christ. This is what we're going to talk about this morning. So let's read from Ephesians 1. Starting in verse 15, we're actually going to go all the way to 2 6. It's going to be, we're going to make it though, alright? Ready? Here we go. Therefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, this is Paul talking to the Ephesians, 
I do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Paul is thinking a lot about the Ephesians, and he's praying for them, and his thoughts about them. And what is he praying especially? That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Him. The knowledge of who? The knowledge of Christ. That what we know about Christ is not just material. What we know about Christ is not simply what He did here on earth. But what we know about Christ is beyond that. And it's where He is now. And it is what He is doing. When you read the Gospels, we'll, we'll come in and out of this passage, okay? So we'll be in there the whole morning. But when you read the Gospels, it's interesting. Each Gospel is introduced by the, by the uniqueness of the author. The book of Matthew starts with the genealogy of Jesus. It goes all the way back to Adam, to the, pre, to the, the birth of Christ. And it goes into the story of John the Baptist, and, and the stories are different. And in the book of Mark, it starts with the birth of Christ and it talks about the temptation of Christ in the wilderness. You read the book of Luke and we love the first two chapters of Luke. That's the narrative of the Christmas story. Not the movie, but the the real story. The real Christmas story. right? And we we read this every Christmas. This is what we do. Growing up, we would do that. My dad would count the people in the room and he would divide up the verses and we would read the whole story. That's how Luke starts. All three of these Gospels, where do they start? They start here on earth in time. But then there's a difference when you get to the book of John. And he starts his letter and he says, in the beginning. In the beginning. When? In the beginning of the the story? In the beginning of the life of Christ here on earth? No, before that. Well, in the beginning of the Jewish history? No, before that. In the beginning of uh, recorded time? No, before that. Uh, in the, when, the, when creation was set and when physical things came in? No, before that. It goes way back. Way back. It says, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. This is Jesus. This is Jesus. Every gospel, every, every narrative is telling you about Jesus. But John goes into who Jesus is beyond, be, way before. And he establishes that Christ was there in fellowship with the Father. Way before any of us, way before any of this, way before any dust came into being. And then you you follow the story of Jesus. It's interesting. The first few verses in the book of John go from before time, right? Like eternity. And goes quickly, in a few verses, he goes quickly to John the Baptist. And he introduces him. But then in John 1.14, it says, The Word became flesh. The Word, who was in the beginning with God and was God, by no confusion, by no no uh, mixture there, he was God. That word in John one fourteen became flesh, and dwelt among us. He became flesh, like us. We we're flesh, and he lived here. And the rest of the book, the rest of the book is about his life here, what he did here. How, who he touched, who he healed, who he spoke to, who he ministered to, who he corrected, how creatively he spoke to us, and how lovingly he treated sinners. And then at the end, in chapter 18 and 19, there's a story of him on the cross. And if you look at chapter 1 and look at chapter 18, you say, how could that be? That the one who was in the beginning... The one who was God, how could it be that he would be subject to a tree, to a cross? And it says in John 1.3 that everything that was made was made by him. There isn't a single thing in this earth that wasn't put in place by God. But then there he is hanging on a tree. 
hanging on his own creation, being pinned, being nailed to his tree, and dying for his creation, uh, emptying himself of everything for us. It's amazing. It's amazing. Think of First First Peter three eighteen. It says that he came from God, and he came down to us. Why? So that he could bring us up to God. This is why he came. This is why John writes this story. This is why Matthew, Mark, and Luke write these stories also, so that we would understand why Christ came. Why Christ came. And this is why Paul is praying for the Ephesian believers and he's saying to them, I pray that you would have the spirit of revelation and wisdom from God in your thinking about who Christ is. In your understanding of who Christ is. Because there is nothing more important in my life than my definition of who Jesus is. A.W. Tozer, I believe, said it. He said, what you believe, who you believe Jesus to be is the most important thing about you. Isn't that interesting? What's the most important thing about you? My car, my house, right? Catching the Black Hawk. What is the most important thing about me? My image, right? My hairdo, right? What is it? It's what I believe Jesus to be. Who do I believe Him to be? In Matthew chapter 16 and verse 15, uh, Jesus came to his disciples. Well, earlier in verse, I think, 14 or 13, he said, Who do men say that I am? What's the word on the street? Right? What's the conversation out there? Who do men say that I am? And I picture the disciples there eating, I assume. Just always picture them eating, right? And then one of them pipes up and says, Somebody said you're John the Baptist. And right? he goes back to his falafel, right? Some say John. Another guy says, some said you're Elijah. Right? And he goes back to his drink or whatever. Right? Another guy, some said Jeremiah. This is the answer they give. So well, this is what people are saying. They're saying you're John the Baptist. And, and is he? No, he's not. He's the one John the Baptist came to declare. Is he Elijah? No, he's not Elijah, but he's the one who comes in the spirit of Elijah and with a different message. Is he Jeremiah? No, but he's coming with a with a definition. There's Jeremiah over there. He's coming with a definition of what Jeremiah spoke about in his in his uh, tear soaked prophecies of Jeremiah and Lamentations. But that's not who he is. And then he says, "That's nice. That's that's nice. Okay. Now I know why they look at me like that." But he says, "But now, who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am?" Okay. This is very important. Peter pipes right up. He doesn't doesn't even take a breath, doesn't take a minute. He says, you are the Christ. You are the Christ. You are the one. And he says, that's it, Peter. That's it. That's it. On that understanding of who I am, based on what you just professed, if you will live that way, if you believe that, then I will build my church. That's a rock. That is a foundation. That is something that is unshakable. That is something that the gates of hell cannot prevail against. They will try. Peter, trust me, they'll try. You will be overcome with unbelievable insecurity and the deepest depression that you will ever know. But the gates of hell will not prevail against you. Peter said that. He made that confession in the presence of Christ and all the disciples, and he says, you're the Christ, you are the Messiah, you are the one. You were fulfilling the plan of God in this earth. And Jesus said, yeah. But, Peter, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna have a hard time. You're going to deny me. You're going to struggle. The, de- the devil will try to sift you. And actually, moments later, he, said, he says, get behind me, Satan. Imagine that. Peter, the rock. The confession with a rock, or the confession that is a rock. And then, get behind me, Satan. In the Gospel of Luke, the story of Luke, when Jesus is brought before, he's, he's in the house there, and Peter is outside by the fire, and he's, he, and he's denying Christ. You know that story? 
He denied Christ how many times? Oh, I gave it away. All right, three times he denied Christ. You know, it says the third time. The third time he denied Christ, it says that Jesus looked at him. Can you imagine that? Peter? Peter, the rock, right? You are the man, Peter. The apostle. The leader. And then he denies him three times and, and he looks and imagine that eye contact with Jesus. How crushing that would be. What would that do to your heart? What would that do to you? But he gets up from it because of the words of Christ. He knew who Jesus was. Jesus came to him in John chapter 21 and never mentioned it one time. Imagine if when Jesus and Peter were walking along the seashore in the end of the story, imagine if Jesus had said to him, you know, I watched you deny me three times. I was right there. I could hear you. Imagine that. Is that gracious? Is that like it says in John 1.14 that he, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us and He was full of what? Grace and truth? That this is the Christ that we know. He is full of grace and truth. And just like when He walked with Peter, He did not bring up the issue. He did not bring up the wrong. But what He brought up was uh, the power of His resurrection and the life that He had. This is what Paul is praying that the Ephesians would understand. I pray that you would not just have a simple understanding of who Jesus is. I pray that it wouldn't just be a culturally acceptable understanding of who Jesus is. We were door knocking yesterday with Gina and Edith and we said, what, do, what can we say to people? What can we say? And I think a great question that we can have that brings up great conversations is we could ask people, are you a Christian? And if they say yes, we say why, how, what does it mean? What does it mean to be a Christian? And it says, well, I was born in this household. And that household was, they were Christians, so I'm Christian. Or I was born in a Christian nation, so I, I guess I'm Christian. And we could say to them, well, if you were born in India, would you be Hindu? If you were born in Saudi Arabia, would you be Muslim? All right? Is it just simply a draw? Or is it that I have met someone, I have met the resurrected Christ, and He has led me into something completely different, a different understanding, a different knowledge, and it's not natural. It's not based on these bones and this flesh and these things that can happen in my body. It's based on revelation. It's based on the Holy Spirit leading me in a different understanding of who Jesus is. So that's verse 7, Terry, right? 17. Necessary. What is necessary in my walk with Jesus? What is necessary in my relationship with Jesus? What is necessary in my understanding of who He is? What's necessary is revelation. Revelation. That He would reveal something to me that is beyond this little world. This little world is so measurable, isn't it? It's so it's so tiny. If you look at it in the solar system, it's a cute little gas ball, right? A little dust ball. It's so measurable, and we measure it well. I know I've said this before, but watching sports nowadays is fascinating because everything is measured, right? You watch golf, there's the trajectory, the distance, the tracker. I love it. It's fascinating, right? You watch baseball, the shade, the, the we could be the own empire, umpires, right? We talk trash about the umpires because we see the strike zone on the TV, and it's perfect. All right. It's so measured and calculated, it's amazing. But that is not our faith. That is not Jesus. Jesus is this way. That He came here from, from, from eternity, and He came here and He dwelt among us, not so that we could understand everything about Him, but that we would understand that He loves us, and that He did something for us that we will not understand at the time. Isn't that what He told the disciples? The things I'm telling you, you don't know right now, but remember them because they will come. And we we have this understanding with Jesus, too, that we don't understand everything. But the more we walk with him, the more we know him and the more things come into picture and we say, oh, that's Jesus. That's Jesus in my life. When we first get saved, we're so happy just to know we're going to heaven. We're so happy just to know that our sins are forgiven. 
But then the more we walk with Him and the more we know Him, the more we are uh, blown away that we have an advocate with the Father, that we have someone who is walking with us, someone who is singing to us, someone who is there encouraging us through the Holy Spirit. And the more we walk with Him, the more we find out about Him, and the more we rejoice in our salvation. But it comes through this necessity, the necessity of revelation. Verse 18, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, right? Opened up, put into picture. That you may know what is the hope of His calling. What are the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints? And what He is, what His, what is the exceeding greatness of His power toward us who believe? Okay. That you would understand something. That there is uh, something at our disposal, something that is working for us, and it is the power of God. That you would understand that you have the power of God in your life. We say, what does that mean? I don't know. I don't know, actually, what it means in its fullness. How, How many people know the power of God? We've seen it. Right? We've seen things, we've felt things, we've experienced things, we've read things through the Bible about the power of God, how He's able to split the Red Sea, how He's able to stop the sun in the sky for 12 hours so Joshua could fight. There is the power of God. But is that, is that what Paul is, or Paul is talking about? He's talking about more. The power in my life. That sin would not have dominion over me. That I would not simply be, he's talking to the Ephesians, that you wouldn't simply be people living in Ephesus. And like us today, that we wouldn't simply be people living in central Massachusetts. That that would not be our whole definition. But that we would experience the power of God in our lives. Where He could quietly lead us against our own understanding and into His understanding. That's powerful. Have you ever tried to bend the will of somebody? That's that's difficult, right? A dog training a dog, training a horse, training a child, right? These strong wills. How how difficult is it to direct the will of somebody? It's not easy. But the by the power of God, He comes to us and He leads us in an understanding that it is not about my will, it's not about my life, but it's about His power in my life. And that by His power, He actually influences our will. And we submit to Him. He doesn't force it, He doesn't push it, but by His love and by His grace, He persuades us to choose a different way. And that we would choose the life of Christ based on what He has revealed. But how has He showed us His power? What is the exceeding greatness of His power toward who? Toward us who believe. The power of God is toward us who believe according to the working of His mighty power. And this is how He shows us His mighty power, which He worked in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and seated Him at His right hand in the heavenly places. He overcame death. Every single one of Paul's epistles talks about not only overcoming sin, but overcoming death, ultimately. And Paul is always talking about people not living in this simple natural world, but be be connected to God in our spiritual life and understand that we are not simply here, but we are there where He is. Because He is there, right? If we are in Christ and He is seated next to the Father, then where are we? In Christ, seated next to the Father. Right? Isn't that amazing? That's simple, isn't it? You can follow that. But He is. we are at His right hand in the heavenly places. Verse 21, Far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And He put all things under His feet and gave Him to be head over all things to the church, which is His body, the fullness of Him that fills all in all. all right? Okay, there is the display. There is the display. There is That is where Christ is. Christ came here, right? He came here 
We see it in the Gospels. He came from heaven. He came here. He walked here. He experienced his life. He felt the dust. His feet were washed, right? He, by, by, by a woman's tears, his feet were washed. He felt pain. Jesus wept when he saw disbelief. Uh, he had compassion on, on death. He had compassion on people who were sick. He touched them. He healed them. He spoke to individuals. The book of John is so good because it's a Christ meeting with individuals. Nicodemus, the woman at the well, Patricia in John 4, right? The blind man in John chapter 9. He is meeting individuals and he is speaking to them and he is touching them and changing their lives. And then he went to the cross unjustly, right? The whole scene, the whole courtroom scene, it's a sham. It's embarrassing. The Pharisees were so embarrassed they tried to pay everybody off to keep a lid on it. But Christ went to the cross. He died. He overcame death, though. He rose from the dead. And He didn't simply rise from the dead and then just walk around this earth. He rose from the dead and He was brought up to the heavens with the Father. And He was seated next to the Father. Forever. Right? That's His place. God accepted the sacrifice. God was pleased with it. And He rejoiced that His Son was coming back. It talks about it in Daniel chapter 7. He rejoiced when the, when the father, when the son was coming back to heaven because there he had purchased our redemption and he had done the work for our salvation. That's where I am. That's what it means for us to be in Christ. That we are with him. Uh, we are with him in our life. As we walk through Marlboro or Stowe or Idaho, right? As we walk through these different places, wherever we are, we walk with Christ. We are in Christ. And we are not simply little dust buckets rolling down the road. But we are made alive. And we are walking with Him. In the simple, little practical ways, we are with Christ. And now every single thing I do is different. Everything I do is different. Am I simply staying at home with the kids? No. No. I am seated with Christ in heavenly places and I am, I have the opportunity to mold these little beautiful children and teach them about the love of Christ and to teach them about the reality of God. We were reading a whale book the other day. We're, we're, we moved on from sharks to whales this week. It's great. Right, whales. And then we got to a page in the whales and it talked about how, you know, of course, right? Of course, the whales before were land mammals. And then they, you know, they were smaller then and they lived on the land. That's why they breathed with lungs and the whole thing. Oh, okay. And then at one point they crawled into the water and that's when they got bigger because they had the ocean that they could grow into. And I, I read it and I, you know, of course, I'm like dying inside and re, and Riley stops me. She goes, that's it. That sounds ridiculous. <laughs> I, said, I said, Amen. That does. <laughs> I'm with you. I just wanted to see what you were going with this. She goes, Isn't it? She says, Doesn't it make more sense that God created whales the way whales are? I said, Hey, I agree. I, I agree. That's what we have. That's a mission. Where am I at work? Right? My work, I am on a mission. That doesn't mean I have to wear a sandwich board that says, you know, turn or burn everywhere I go, right? Like, I don't have to be like in your face with everywhere I go, but I live my life like my life is seated in heaven. And that is so unavoidable in this world. It shows that I live by a different principle. I I make my decisions based on something else. And I am not simply living here on earth, but I am seated in heavenly places with Christ. And I will allow that to feed my thinking. I will allow that to feed my motivation. I will allow that to to lead me in my decisions. So it will be different. My conversation will be different. right? It will all be different because of where I am. Okay, chapter 2. And you, and you, right? And you, He made alive. You, who made alive. Why did He need to make us alive? Well, we were dead in trespasses and sins. We were dead in where? Uh, Dead in sins and trespasses. Blatant. uh, Have you ever seen a no trespassing sign? 
There it is. No trespassing. And you look at it and you say, man, I didn't even want to go in there. But now I'm so tempted. Right? I know they don't want me in there, but now I'm so curious. I got to go. I got to get in there. Trespass. Right? Trespass. You know you're not supposed to, but you by your own will say, I'm going to. To trespass. And sins. Voluntary, involuntary, our sins. We were dead in them. Hand in the cookie jar, security camera, caught you, hop in the fence, whatever it is. We were dead in our trespasses and sins in which we once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, uh-huh, among whom also we once conducted ourselves. I love how Paul says that in verse 3. He brings the self-righteous people right back down to earth. Right? Because you could read that list and you say, yeah, those people, that guy, ooh, that section over there, yeah, that's them dead in their trespasses and sin. And then Paul says, oh, by the way, all of you live this way. Right? Are any of you Jesus? He's the only one that hasn't lived this way. And if you declare that you are Jesus, we can have a conversation afterwards. I listened to a conversation this week between Ravi Zacharias and and uh, Ben Shapiro. It was a good, a good, good exchange. And uh, Ravi Zacharias says he spoke to a Jewish man one time, and the Jewish man said to him, "I only have one question when the Messiah comes." Only one question, and that's, were you here before? Have you been here before? Does that make anybody get it? Isn't that a good question? Like, did I miss it? <laughs> were you here before? And we were saying, what we're saying here is he was here. I don't know why I said that, but anyway. All right, among whom, among whom also we once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh. We all conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh in our mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, just as others. By nature, right? This is our, this is our state. This is where we were. But God. But God. But God. But God. What does that mean? But God. John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. God, He sent His Son, but God, who was rich in mercy and His great love, wherewith He loved us. That's it. In His great love, wherewith He loved us. Uh, Even when we were dead in trespasses, He made us alive together with Christ. When we had no shot, when we were dead, He came and He made us alive together with Christ. With Christ, by grace you are saved. With Christ. Imagine if there was a lesser than. Like He made you somewhat alive. Now let's see if you can make it the rest of the way. Like He kind of redeemed you, but you need to work out the rest. No, He made us alive with Christ. With Christ. How alive was Christ when He came out of the tomb? Did he walk out like like a zombie, right? Like we all know the mummy, the mummy movies. Was he just like roaming around, Mary? Uh, no, he was alive. He was alive, and he was doing things. He was ministering to people. He was speaking to people. Luke chapter twenty-four, amazing story. He's walking with two guys. He's walking with two guys who had walked away from their hope, who had walked away from Christ. On the third day, he's supposed to raise from the dead today, but we're not going to wait and find out. We're out of here. Those are the guys that Christ came to. This is the one. This is our attitude sometimes where we are walking away from the source of our hope. We are walking away from the source of our love. We are walking away from the source. And that's when Christ comes to us and says, remember that you were dead in sins? Remember you were dead in your trespasses? That's when I came to you, and that's when I showed you how much I love you. That's how when I overcame it all, and I made you alive. I made you alive. And then in verse 6, And He raised us up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Okay, This is my prop time. I have this. It's, supposed to, it's my rope, right? He, he made us alive to sit, sit with Him in heavenly places. Now turn with me to Hebrews Chapter 6, in closing. Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews 6, verse 19. This hope we have. This hope we have. We have it. right? And what is it? 
as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become the high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. What, where is my life? My life has been put in Christ. <laughs> this is simple. My life is put in Christ. Where has Christ gone? He has gone. He has ascended to the Father and He has gone within the veil. What is the veil? It's the thing that separates the holiness of God from man. All right, so we'll say that doorway is the veil. Okay, I'll go through the veil. Okay, so the anchor, my anchor goes before me. Go ahead. This verse seven or verse seventeen talks about him being my forerunner. Forerunner. What is a forerunner? Someone who runs before. All right, someone who runs before, beyond the veil. He is there. He is in heaven. And he, where is my life? It is in him. Right? And now my life is anchored in heaven. This is the reality. This is like Paul is saying, you are in Ephesus. We are in central Massachusetts. Here we are. But you're in Christ. You're in Christ. And he has gone all the way and he has anchored me there. Have you ever seen a humongous ship come into a harbor? Huge ship, and then you think it's going there. How can it get there? And then the little tugboat comes out, right? Bop, bop, bop. They drop the anchor into the tugboat. The tugboat brings the anchor into the harbor, anchors the ship there, and then the ship simply winds itself back up and it is brought to the destination. That Christ is my forerunner, where my life has been placed in Christ. Like he's a tugboat, right? There's a new typology of Christ. He's a tugboat, right? Like my life has been placed in Christ and he has gone before me and he has dropped the anchor in eternity, in heaven, in the presence of God. And I am, I am connected to it. This line, look at it. Like when Christ tugs on the line, do I feel it? Right? Oh, 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 oh. Like I am connected with Christ. And in my life and in my experience, I want to understand this. I want this to be my understanding and the premise of my life that I am seated in heavenly places. And as I live my life, as I do simple little things, I would feel that that tug from eternity saying that you are here. You are secure. What does it say about Christ? Both sure and steadfast. Those are good things, aren't they? If you're going to put your life in something, would you want it to be rickety and uncompromised? No, you want it to be sure and steadfast. Jesus is the only thing that is sure and steadfast. He was, right? John 1, 1, He was. He came here. He took this. And He took my life. And He has anchored me in heaven. And I am in Christ. I have an anchor for my soul. Where else can I find that? What other, what other thing can say you're good? You're secure. You're saved. Nothing. Only Jesus. And He came here to show us this. And Paul is writing to the Ephesians and saying, I, I am praying that you would understand this thing. That you are seated with Christ in heavenly places. And nothing can change that. Nothing can take that. You can't give it away. It is the work of Christ. And He's done it for us. 1 Corinthians 1.30 Of Him we are in Christ. Of Him we are in Christ. By grace you are saved. Ephesians 2.5 and 2.8 It's so important. So when, when we have this question, thank you Jesus, right? Isn't that good? When we have this question, we say, who is Jesus, right? Who is Jesus? And we say, oh, I could go on and on and on and on. We can be like the, the woman, the Shunammite woman in Song of Solomon. Right When they say, who is your beloved? Why is he so special? And she goes on for sentences about why he is so amazing and so, so, uh, so different. We have Jesus. Our life is secure in him. Our life is anchored in eternity. Let's be feeling that, right? And if we doubt it, then give a little tug on the rope and say, hey, am I still there? And he'll say, yeah, uh, yeah, right? Yep, you're good. You're in me. You're in me. And if you are written, your name is written on the palm of my hand. I got you. Amen. Amen. Lord, thank you for 
uh, this morning. Thank you for this position that we have in you. And if there's anybody here who's never received Jesus, you've never put your faith in Him and trusted Him with your life, just say in your heart, Lord Jesus, I need You. I'm a sinner. I need a Savior. I'm dead in my trespasses and sin, but I want life in You. Come into my heart and live. Give me everlasting life. And if you said that prayer, raise your hand real quick. We'll pray with you. Okay, Lord, thank You for this time. Thank You for this church. Thank You for... Uh, leading us in this understanding. In Jesus' name, Amen.